Thank you. Good. All right, lights are on as well. Good. Um, so good to see you all here. Uh, and indeed, today we're going to talk about business models. Uh, my uh, my favorite uh, my favorite topic. And what we're basically going to do today, uh, we're all going to think like designers. Uh, we're going to apply the whole design thinking uh, a lot. Who here is completely new to design thinking? No one. Ha, ah, that's a very good start. Could someone here explain to me what is design thinking? Any suggestions? What is design thinking? Yes. Starting with the end user in mind and doing a lot of iterations and have very porous feedback cycle. Yeah, start with the end in mind. Yeah? So, so who's the end user and what am I want to do for, uh, which problem do I want to solve for that end user? Yeah, some other thoughts as well, yes? Yeah, using the tools for design for social and broader innovation. Yeah, and it's and it's very fascinating. I've actually once done some some in-depth research about the definition of design thinking, and the definition is actually not there. So that's and that's for me actually one of the characteristics characteristics of design thinking. The single right solution does not exist, right? And it's just like yeah, this uh, this famous uh, designer Karl Lagerfeld, and when when he was looking into I want to design a new dress. Then what does he do? He takes a sheet of paper and he's going to draw plenty of, a lot of dresses, right? Just not one, maybe a hundred dresses. Very fast, he's making quick designs. He's throwing out 90 of them, he's taking those 10. Like, okay, they might be nice. He's maybe making some combinations. He finds some fabric somewhere in a corner. So he's taking the fabric, manually just stitches together that dress, put it on a, on a doll, like on a mannequin, and like, well, how does it look? Oh, I need to adjust the design a little bit because it's a little weird. Let's get a human in and let's put the dress actually on a human and then again change the design, right? So he's going through a lot of those loops before he's saying, now let's implement and bring this into practice. But what do we do in business? Very weird. We just basically create one business plan and then we want to put that into production immediately and then we learn it doesn't work. Huh, interesting, right? So for me, that's another element of design thinking that I, that I really love about this and I want to see like how can we apply this to business? How can we apply this to our day-to-day -day world? And basically that means that we need to have some new tools, skills and mindsets and, and, and able to do that. And why is that so important? That is because business as usual is actually dead, right? We see that everywhere around us. We see many companies not surviving. And then what we do is we write business plans. But a business plan is not going to be a solution. Maybe that's the best news of today. Stop writing business plans, right? Because it's usually all about the single right solution. It takes three to six months to put it together. Uh, by the time the ink is dry, the world changed again, right? Uh, and, and no business plan ever survived the first customer contact. So stop writing business plans. However, our objective is we want to have a better business. And what's the objective of that better business is? That will vary, right? For some, it will be more money, but it could also be for the social good, right? Then you can all have different purposes. We need to have that. So today, what we're going to do, I'm going to give you some tools. Like, how can we use this design thinking really for business? And what we're going to do, we're going to create this common language here in the room, and then maybe you bring back that common language to your work environment as well, and so that we can create better businesses and better design. So are you ready for that? Yes? OK, good. So short introduction about myself. This is me. My name is it's a little dark with, um, uh, with the Beamer. Maike, it's always a very difficult name. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's actually Dutch. I'm from the Netherlands. That's the country where I'm at. Do you guys know any Dutch companies, actually? Uh, anyone? Sorry, which one? Shell. Shell, yes. Other? KLM. KLM, yeah. Philips. Philips. DHL. Don't, no, it doesn't immediately ring a bell. Uh, but it's good to hear some Dutch ones. And I brought some, uh, some other ones as well. Unilever. We all know Unilever, right? It's always a bit of a competition. Is that UK or is that Dutch? But that's 50-50. So we say, of course, it's Dutch. Um, we have Heineken. We all know Heineken, right? That's, uh, that was an easy one. Shell, Philips, ING. I think a lot of you know ING as well. Uh, Booking.com. 
I guess that's also where you make a lot of reservations, Dutch company. Anyone ever heard of Chesto and Armin van Buren? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, it's usually the, the, the younger generation knows this a little better. Uh, they, it is true. It's just a fact. <laughs> uh, because uh, Chesto and Armin van Buren are always in the top five of the best DJs in the world. And so you do see that that attracts a different audience, right? So that's, uh, that's Chesto and uh, Armin van Buren. ASML, anyone know that one as well? Eh, that's, that's a big one here in uh, San Jose. They have a huge office uh, here also. And I think uh, which other one? We transfer. It's always nice. It's a bit of a more startup. And Agen, I think that's the company the Netherlands is most proud of these days. It's a fintech. They just had their IPO last summer, and they're going through the roof. It's actually the first and only unicorn the Netherlands ever produced, so we're super proud of that one. And so uh, they have their office in San Francisco as well. They have about 100 people sitting there. So you might, uh, you might run into that. So some little background, right, about this tiny little country where I'm from, the Netherlands. But about four years ago, I moved to this beautiful city, to San Francisco. Because what I saw with my company, Business Models Inc., um, I was actually on a plane a lot in the US, and we're like, hey, we should have our own office here also. But if you really want to do this the proper way, making sure that the culture, the values, the methodology are translated properly, it was like one of us had to move, eh? and, and us was um, uh, Patrick and, and me, and we, we run the global company, and I just happened to be the lucky one. And so uh, I jumped on the plane, took my husband with me, and then uh, we moved over to San Francisco where we uh, started our office. And right now we also have an office in, uh, in New York. And that's about a year ago because I, I always also wanted to go to New York. So I'm sort of going back and forward between, uh, between the two coasts to, uh, to roll this out. So um, with, with that as a little background, like, uh, I made this another nice one, Business Models Inc. So that's my company. Can you see where I'm at on this visual? Which one's me? On the far right. What's that? The, the far right. Not the far right, no. Yeah, the skirts and the building the money back. Yes, the money back is mine. Yes, that's, uh, I'm, I'm also the global CEO of over company. I always joke that's sort of my weekend job. And during the week, I'm what we call a strategy designer. And we help organizations with their strategies and innovations in, in a different way uh, without writing plans. Uh, but I love numbers. I just uh, I studied math, so I, I don't know. Someone had to become the CFO, and that turned out to be me. But I actually like that. And, and how it all started, it all started with the book Business Model Generation. Who of you has ever seen this book, Business Model Generation? Yes, a few. Who's ever seen the Business Model Canvas? You love it as well. It's fabulous. Good. And the Business Model Canvas? It's probably some more hands, right? And, and this book, the Business Model Generation book, that's where we brought the Business Model Canvas alive. And, and we're the producer of this book. Uh, Ten years ago already, we brought this into the markets. Um, and I think it was just perfect timing uh, because people were fed up with the business plans. But we still need to go through the thinking steps. And the Business Model Canvas will really help you to sort your thoughts. And we're going to go through that all in detail uh, later, later today. Uh, but what we also saw... And after the success of this book, we're like, hey, we should have um, another book because it's not just about the business model canvas, about this one tool. It's about tools, skills, and mindsets. So we produced this book, Design a Better Business. Has, everyone, has anyone seen this one before? A few people. We always call it the yellow book inside. But, uh, and it has a lot of tools and, and mindsets um, uh, items in there. Like, so what do you do with that? If you're going to do it in a different way, how can you actually do this? And because in, in the end, it's all about doing is cheaper than, um, than planning, right? So it's all about let's do this and actually also let's do this together. Having one on one is three is what we truly believe in. And actually, that's what we see here in, in this area the co innovation, as we like to call it, companies innovating together is a significant trend that we've been seeing specifically around here, and uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. And you can actually create way more value together. And we have offices basically all around the world, and from San Francisco all the way to Australia, uh, where we uh, have a team, uh, team as well. But it all started out in, uh, in Amsterdam. So uh, this is, has a little background, uh, but then it's about, like, uh, why is this so popular? Because you saw the numbers with the Business Model Generation book. Three million books sold, yes, super nice, but why, right? Why is that so popular? And that's because what we see is that companies. And not only uh, the small companies, 
but you will also see some large companies, uh, and some people will recognize themselves on here, uh, where you see that um, um, good year is turning into bad year, right? Uh, 3M is becoming 2M and you see some other Xerox running out of ink. And so you see that a lot of organizations are struggling these days. Like how can we stay relevant? And how can we basically disrupt before someone else is disrupting us? Because I mean, change has always been there. Eh? We've always seen that. But the speed of change right now is exponential. Eh? It's, it goes through the roof. Where you, if you see with internet, with the globalization, uh, the way we have access to knowledge, it's just insane, the speed of change, right? And how do you need to keep up? So that means that many organizations feel this uncertainty, like, oh, wow, then what do I do with that? If everything is changing, then, then what do I hold on to? And what we, what we used to do, uh, we, we're trying to look for certainty. And then what we do, we label things. And so, okay, let's label it, let's put them in a bucket, we feel more certain about that. And, or the other thing that we do, we create a business plan. Yeah, but we already told you, that's not what you should do anymore. Because uh, the labeling, the business plans, is basically the fake certainty that we're creating for ourselves. We need to get out of thought lens. And we need to get out there and basically get out of the blah blah uh, that we put ourselves into. By the way, this is our, these are our favorite cards, no blah blah. And you can keep them uh, to the office, home. They're very useful, I can tell you that. Uh, but uh, we need to stop the blah blah and get out of thought lens. And, and basically what we need to do is we need to deal with uncertainty. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's just, I always love this here in this area. We all recognize this picture, right? And there's this fog coming at us. <clears throat> and, and what do we do? And so we need to embrace that uncertainty. And today I'm going to talk you through some steps, like how can we do that? How can we get more comfortable with that uncertainty? That uncertainty is just a fact. Now let's embrace it and let's do something with that. And because we see that the rules of the business have changed. And if you look at uh, some of the devices that we used to have, um, and for example, um, all these old devices, we probably all recognize and we probably all had them as well. And our world today looks completely different. And if we look at, for example, books, I, I remember when I moved uh, countries, I mean, I had an enormous amount of books. I basically threw them all out and I replaced them with a single one device, with the Kindle where I can have everything just in that one in my pocket, right? Also, if I travel, I don't need to think which three books will fit my suitcase. No, I can take 300 books if I want to, right? And then you see many other examples. For example, ownership, where before we always wanted to own that car, like it's mine, but you see the shift more and more, specifically in the larger cities, to like, hey, let's, let's use a car instead of own it. Yeah, like the BMW Drive Now, and there are many other initiatives out there. Also for me, when I moved four years ago, I did not buy a car. I was like, why do I need a car? On a day like this, I just get a zip car or a get around. I'll just dump into the car and, and use the car. That's fine, right? But I don't need to own it anymore. Um, or where you see in music, and you probably all remember that you went through uh, in the record store, like, oh yeah, which, which album am I gonna buy today, right? Uh, what am I gonna do? Which was a great experience, but today we have this jukebox on our, on our phone with every song you can basically imagine is on there and you have access to it. And so you see that it's really changing. And we're currently in the middle of writing a new book, which is actually called The Business Model Shifts. Like, what are the main shifts that we see happening? And we identified six of them. And this is still work in progress, right? So it might change in the end, but uh, this is what it looks like uh, at this moment. And one of the examples that we see is that we see a shift from pipeline to platform business model. Yeah, where first it was all like one dimensional, right? I'll just produce it and the, the user will buy it. But as a platform, we're connecting multiple parties together on our platform. Any example of a platform business model? Amazon, Amazon yes. Uber, yeah, it's definitely also a platform business model where we're connecting yeah, the drivers and the riders that want to take. This one is really growing super fast in every industry and we see platform business models popping up. The other business model that we, uh, that we can see is from physical to digital. Yeah, we saw, for example, the, the music industry as an example. Any other examples that we know of? Video? 
Newspapers, yes, newspapers, but also video and Netflix, for example, uh, also um, uh, moving into that direction. Or another shift that we, that we can see is from products to services. I think uh, what we just had with the BMW drive now, eh, you don't need to own the, the product anymore, you can just use it. But this goes pretty far at the airport in Amsterdam, for example. Philips, of course, Philips is a supplier there, <laughs> but, but for the lights that you see in the airports, they're not selling the light bulbs, they're selling the amount of light hours. So it's really as a service. Like, we take care of all the lights. We'll just make sure that the lights are on. You see it with planes. The tires are on planes. There are a couple of companies that do that as a service, uh, basically saying, OK, for every landing, you know, you pay per landing instead of you pay per tire. Complete different business model, right? So the shift that you see into services. The other one that we can see is from linear to exponential business models. Yeah, because usually we had a more linear growth and yeah, we have to do certain investments and we could make this growth, another investment growth. Right now it's really some companies exponential growth. Do we know any examples there? Real exponential growth? For example, it's always WhatsApp. I don't know, in the US somehow it's not used that much, even though it's from this area. Uh, but uh, everywhere else in the world, it's really being used. When they got acquired for billions, they only had a team of 50 people, right? It's, it's insane with that piece of software, how they could scale without having to ramp up their resources, right? So that's when you can really get to an exponential growth without any large investment that you needed to have. Uh, um, another one that we, um, that we can see is from shareholder to stakeholder. Do we know any examples there? Yes, it's not only about the shareholder value, but it's about the stakeholder value that we're creating. B corporations, yes, for sure. Patagonia, right, is always a... So it was the largest one here, I think, that we all know, yeah, as really it's not just for the money anymore, it's really for, for a better world. And luckily you see more and more, you also see it in the investments uh, atmosphere, you see more and more impact investors popping up. Yeah, like it's not just about the money, I really want us to make an impact, and I'm only investing in those organizations that do, where you do see B Corp certification indeed as, a, as one of the elements as well. And the last one uh, that we have is from singular to circular. Yeah, so let's get rid of singular use of stuff. Let's see if we can make that circular. Can we use the same material or even the same item more than just once? Do we know an example of that one? Singular to circular? Making clothing out of plastic bottles. Yeah, making clothing out of plastic bottles. That's a good example. One of my favorites is a company called Gumshoes. They're out of Amsterdam. Uh, they literally scrape up the gum uh, off the streets. They, of course, clean that, right? And then they, they turn that material into uh, uh, sneakers, into shoes. And they're bright pink, super fun, right? So really like the bubble gum pink. Yeah? So that's, that's gum shoes. And that's really about circular. Like how can I reuse materials or just making clothing out of plastic bottles and so on? And you see that's a huge trend. A little less, I have to say, in this side of the world. I think Europe um, is definitely going slightly faster with that. But more and more organizations are working on that. Like, oh, we need to be part of this movement. This is very important. Hey, all the single use is definitely going to go down. So that as, um, as some, some background on like, hey, why is this all so important, right? And why do we actually use this whole design thinking notion? And we don't like to say just design thinking, we actually like to speak about design doing. Because I think that's where the real force is about design thinking. It is already all about the doing. And we were talking earlier about the definition, and one of the definitions that I really like is, it's a human-centered and collaborative approach to problem solving and that's creative, iterative, and practical. And so I think what we said before, it's, it's the, the individual central, the one that you're creating it for. It's collaborative. It's typically not something that you do on your own. It's uh, get multiple perspectives in. Problem solving, we're actually solving a problem instead of pushing a solution. And that's a huge difference, of course, that we see. And we're creative, iterative, and practical. Let's do it. Yeah? So the whole design doing, how can we actually get that together? And in more the business language, what I see, it's integrating the three dimensions of customer desirability. Can I find a customer that actually wants this? Business viability, 
can I make money with this or at least cover my cost, right? Whatever your objective is. And technical feasibility, can I actually make this? Where traditionally I see the majority of the organizations is focusing on technical feasibility. And some corporates spend two, three years on R&D and never thought about customer desirability or business viability. Yeah, there are plenty of companies that come over to me like, look, I made this, but now I don't know what to do with it, right? How do I monetize this? And I see that those three should go more hand in hand in a very fast and iterative manner, right? Don't, don't write business plans because that's definitely useless, yeah, but how can we do that way faster? And what we see is uh, it's, it's all about the search for the problems, not for the solutions. And it's, it's all about uh, the, the customer centricity that we're speaking about. And the other one is the single right solution does not exist, right? That's, that's for me the core, the core elements of this whole design thinking notion. And in the end, right, the, what, what we see, what is really a designer? And we say it's, it's a rebel with a cause, right? It's not just a rebel to be a rebel, but a rebel uh, with a cause. And that's why we need these tool skills and mindsets that we spoke about earlier. So let me stop the blah blah, let me get into that first tool, right, that we wanted to discuss uh, with you today that you can use in this quest of how do I design a better business. The business model canvas. So there were a few people here that uh, have seen the business model canvas and some are completely new. So I'm going to take you through. The starting point is like, what's, what's your definition of a business model? If you would Google the word business model, what do you get? What's your, what's your take? What's your definition of a business model? Systematic way to create and capture value. Way to and capture value. Someone read the book there, that's good. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah, because what, what I found when I first searched for, uh, for business model, I actually came up with this beautiful business model on, the, on my screen. My, my male colleagues had, had some different versions of this. But what we quickly learned is like, oh, we need to have a common language, right? If we're saying, if we're calling out the word business model, we need to make sure we all have the same definition of the word business model. Because sometimes people say, it's the revenue model, it's how I make money. Yes, that also, but it's more than just that. So the definition that we're using uh, is the, the definition from the book is how as an organization, how you create, deliver, and capture value. And that's what it's all about, and that's where the business model canvas can help you to put that all in place. So the business model canvas, it's a pretty easy, straightforward model, nine building blocks. There's a whole PhD behind this, by the way. It's not just some random boxes that have been put together on a piece of paper. It's been a four-year PhD um, uh, that, that went into this to actually come up with the whole business model canvas. And the first uh, building block that we see is the customer segments. Who is your customer? Sounds pretty easy. It's usually very difficult for organizations to identify who is really my customer. And I always make the distinction between who's the one that's paying, who's the one that's receiving, and who's the one that's deciding. And sometimes that's the same individual, but sometimes it's completely different. And it's completely different groups. Even within an organization, it's completely different groups. But also if you go to a hospital, for example, where there is the patient that is receiving care, where the insurance company is paying, hopefully, right? Uh, that depends on your location. Uh, but uh, the insurance company is definitely a payer in the whole equation. And then who's the decision maker? Very often it's family members uh, or friends. Sometimes it's a patient itself, but sometimes it's family. It all depends on the situation. So there you immediately see three complete different customer segments. So who's that customer? Then the next one is, what is my offering to my customer? What's the value proposition? And the value proposition is, for me, it's two elements. One is the promise. And so if, if you buy my thing, then what, what will you get? What is it that I promise you will get? And the actual product or service that is connected to it. The combination of the two, that's the value proposition. So for example, you can say, um, you will look 10 years younger, right? As sort of the, the promise. Yeah, then what, but what are you actually selling? Oh, it's a new eye cream or something like that, or an anti-wrinkle cream. And that's the product. And it's, of course, always about the combination. And I say this very explicit because at least half of the time when I receive a business model canvas to review, people forget to mention the actual product. 
It's very interesting because you would say it's pretty straightforward. They all put all the promises in there. Like it will look younger and, and I don't know what, right? It will be more attractive and you feel more uh, certain about yourself and blah, blah. But they forget to mention the actual product or service. So don't forget that one. And once you have a customer and a value proposition, how do you connect those with each other? What are the channels? And where can I find this product or service? Is that online? Is that in store? Is that through an account manager? How do we connect? And once I made the connection, how do I keep my customer in here? What's the customer relationship? And also there you see a huge movement over the past years. More and more emphasis is being made on the customer relationship. And it's not a one-off transaction. I actually need to work very hard to keep my customer or he or she will change to someone else. So what's that? Bottom line, what's my revenue? And what are the different revenue streams that I identified? Is that a subscription? Is that pay-per-use? Is that a fixed one-off fee? Or is it free? Eh, whatever. Eh, how do you make money? And this side of the business model canvas, it's the right side, we call that, that's all about value creation. And so what is the value that you create for your customers and for your own organization in terms of money? Another way to look at it is we say it's, it's front stage. It's everything that you see out there and it's everything that the customer can actually see. Because the other part of the Canvas model is about is backstage. That's what you need to do as an organization to make the front happening. So what needs to be happening in the back? Key resources. What do you need to have to make it happen? Factories, people, processes, knowledge, partnerships, network. You can think of a couple of different things. That is what you all need to have. And then key activities. What is it that those resources need to do? Key activities are really verbs. And those are things that we're doing together with the resources. And the other one is the key partners. Who am I doing this together with? And because today you don't need to do anything in, on your own anymore. So who are my key partners? And a key partner, in my opinion, is not just a supplier. A key partner is someone who's really making a change in your value proposition. Without that key partner, you would not be able to deliver that. And bottom line, what are my costs? That's the last one of the nine building blocks. Looks pretty easy, right? Yeah, done. OK, good. Now let's look at an example. So let's have a look at the business model canvas in practice. So this one, which company is this? Oh, we already know. Uh, Nespresso. Um, and so, uh, and because we often say, like, what's the real value proposition of Nespresso? And everyone is always saying, George Clooney, right? That's the, that's the real value proposition. But what is the value proposition of, uh, of Nespresso? Good coffee at home. Good coffee at home. Yes, good coffee for sure. It's fast and easy. Fast and easy. Yeah, so basically what we see is, hey, it's, that, it's that cup of coffee, and indeed it's, it's in that environment. It's more than just that cup of coffee, right? It's that experience, it's that easy or luxury feeling. Uh, that's, that's, that's all connected to this, to this cup of coffee. Who are the customer segments of Nespresso? Good coffee at home, so that was one customer segment. <laughs> Wealthy people that can't think straight till they had their coffee. <laughs> so, uh, definitely, that's uh, that's uh, that's definitely marketing segmentation that they are that they are using. And so, so good coffee at home. What's the other place? Good coffee at work. It used to be all the same. They had the same patches for both private and and uh, business, but then they learned very quickly that uh, those coffee cups disappeared, specifically on Friday afternoon people took them home, right? So like, let's change the patches so that we actually have a differentiation here in the customer segments. Um, what are the channels for Nespresso? Where can you buy Nespresso? Online. Online. Bed Bath & Beyond. Bath Bath & Beyond, okay. Some retail stores. Where can you not buy Nespresso? Not in the grocery store, supermarkets. Right? It's not there. And it's actually very interesting if you think about that because that's a place where you do your groceries and you often buy coffee, but you cannot find Nespresso there. It's indeed, it's, it's, it's in the, they have special Nespresso shops uh, in San Francisco. There's one. There must be some here in San Jose as well. I would be surprised if it's not. Um, as some specific retail stores online. 
not in the supermarkets. And that's interesting because they were in the supermarket before, same products, didn't work. So the new CEO came in and he said, you know what? Let me take it out of the supermarket. Let me work on the channels. But that was not the only thing he did. He did something very smart in customer relationship. What is the key thing in a customer relationship of Nespresso? It's like a subscription, not, could be, yeah, some, you can make it a subscription. But yeah, it's basically what it is. It's an Nespresso club. You're a member of the club. And whether you're George Clooney or whoever you are, you're just as special because we're all part of this club, right? But what was the smart thing about that, they brought it out of, you know, they didn't know before who's buying my coffee because it was at the supermarket, so you have no clue. Like, who's buying my coffee? How often um, do they buy my coffee? Do they test the different flavors or are they staying with one flavor? You just have no clue. There's no data available. But by putting it in the club, all of a sudden, they have all this information available about their customers. When are they buying? How often? And if there's some espresso drinkers, what people usually say is, you get this email like, hey, isn't it time to order your coffee? And then you look in your kitchen and you're like, ha, huh, actually, this is the right moment to order my coffee because I will run out in a couple of days, right? So they're really good at anticipating on your buying behavior or con consumption behavior. And they, they, of course, adjust their marketing to it to accommodate you to it. So that's a pretty interesting thing. Revenue uh, streams, what how do they how do you earn money? On the, on the patches, right? It's basically, it's a small money back on the machines, big money back on the coffee uh, patches, right? It's almost like a subscription. I think you actually can make it a subscription as well. You just say, bring me this every X weeks. Yeah. Just like the razor blades? Yeah, and that we call that model sort of the bait and hope model because you have that device, just like your razor, you have that device, but you, you need to have those blades or you need to have those coffee cups, so you come, you come back, just like printers with cartridges. The printers are pretty cheap to buy, right? It's really cheap these days to buy a printer. Cartridges are really expensive, right? But you, but you will come back. You will buy those cartridges of that brand specifically, and because otherwise you get all these errors in your machine, so you're, you don't want to get uh, to any other one. Um, the key uh, activities, um, I believe, we have up next. Uh, no, sorry, that is the key resources. What are the key resources of Nespresso? What do they need to have? So sort of the production, yeah? Design, yeah. So what we see in the key resources is the, is the whole production process, uh, everything that's related to that. It's also the Nespresso Club, all the member information, all that data that they gathered about the people. But it's all, it used to be also the patents. That patent expired because they had the patent on the little cups. They were the only ones that were allowed to produce that for those machines. That one expired, so you see there's more pressure now on their model. It's definitely changing, but that used to be one of their key resources. Key activities, what we typically see in there is um, and we, have the, we have the production process, of course, that's what they need to do, marketing, and that's another thing that they need to do, and the whole logistics. And who's the key partner for Nespresso? DeLonghi, yeah, it's indeed, it's the, it's the coffee um, machine makers. They have outsourced that, they don't do that themselves, but without the machine, the whole model will fall apart. And so that's a very interesting one. And what we see in cost, uh, it's of course they need to pay George, they need to pay for the production and they need to pay for the logistics, right? Uh, the whole marketing expense is, uh, is huge. Yeah, but that's the, that's the business model of an espresso. So just to take you through an example, like how do you use it? And the fun part is as well, in the business model canvas, you can use it as a storytelling device. Right? If you really do this properly, you can tell the whole story about your organization, how everything is connected with each other. Because these building blocks, even though they're separate, they're all connected. And if, you, and if you've been a user a couple of times of the business model canvas, you will see more and more how important it is to correlate these building blocks. And that's also what I find the, the power of this model is that it's, it's a one pager, right? It's pretty easy. Everyone in the organization will understand this. Really, everyone will get this. Uh, but also, if you want to change something, if you say, as a customer segment, I want to add something different to it, then you can put that post-it there. But then immediately, you need to ask yourself, then what's going to change in my value proposition? 
something going to be different? Or no, maybe it's the same value proposition, I'm just going to use a different channel. Oh, okay, then I need to make the changes there. And oh, if I change that in the front, what do I need to change in the back? Do I need to have different resources? Do I need to do different activities, different partners, different costs? So you immediately see how all the building blocks are, are related to each other. And that's the power to very quickly see, hey, what if I make that change? And, and really in 10 minutes, five minutes, uh, you, can, you can create a new business model. Hey, what if? Let's just put the post-its out there. Let's see what we got. Oh, interesting. We can make another one now as well. Yeah, and we can compare the two models. Yeah, so that's how you can get into the design thinking, quickly sketching our businesses instead of writing the business plan. And of course, Nespresso also needs to go to, um, to figure out new models because there's a lot of competition since the patent has been gone. And one of the things that we've been seeing is, uh, is this one, the baby Ness, coffee for babies. No, uh, it's, uh, it's baby formula uh, where you can basically same system as you can use for your coffee. You put the cup in there with the baby formula, you just press the button and then your bottle of milk will come out with, uh, with the milk and at the right temperature. Everyone can do it, just simply press the button. I've had ma many young mothers in here were like, oh, I need this, right? <laughs> so they're, and they're, they're definitely working on this. And specifically in the whole family of Nespresso, right? The whole Nestle family, they have many other products uh, for this customer segment. So uh, that might be a very interesting one to work on uh, for them. But now let's have a look. Now we know the business model because we said today I'm going to take you through the process, but we're also going to have a look at what is that business model for SVODN? And what can we do there? And uh, are there new business models that we can actually think of, as Jeff already mentioned? So I want to take you quickly through what is actually the current business model. Uh, because if you change something, you first need to know where are we today, right? So otherwise, we don't know uh, what our uh, starting point is. And so we created the business model uh, for uh, the SVODN. So if you go into that business model, uh, what do we see the, as, the, as the customers for SVODN? Who are the customers for SVODN? How do we? Businesses, students. Uh, yes, the professionals, yes. Students, yes. Uh, but, but we, oh, I, I did it the other way around, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, uh, basically what we see in these, uh, so let's, let's go on to the, to the value proposition. Uh, it's the provider of choice for ongoing development and growth in the field of OD, right? I think that's really uh, the, the key value proposition that's in the mission of uh, SVODN, uh, where you also see the insight in the job opportunities. Have people want to increase network development, the growth of an organization. And there are these events, like today, right? That's an actual product and what we all can, uh, can see. But also the OD Learning Laboratory, what I understood. And if you, if you look at uh, the, the customer segments that are connected with that, it's the OD professionals, as we uh, identified it, internal and external. It's students, as you mentioned, but also some corporate sponsors. And yeah, like, who's paying? And yeah, that was another very important one. And so the corporate sponsors are... Uh, the faculty, yeah. Yeah, they're basically also sponsoring, right? In, the, in a way of also making uh, a room like this available and so on. Good one, yeah. And what you also see in the revenue streams, uh, we identified there is, there's some free sticky notes in there. Like even if something is for free, we always make that very explicit because that's been a choice not to charge a membership fee, but to actually make something available for free. So we make that very explicit, because later on if you say we want to change it, then you can change it, but then you know at least it's there. There's the events fee, and of course the sponsorship. What you also might see is a little color coding happening here. And yeah, that's what I very often do with the business model. If we have different customer segments, give them all their own color, so that you can, it's easier to see the correlation in the different building blocks that we see happening there. And so the other thing that we see is uh, in the channels, mouth to mouth. I think, Jeff, that's what you asked uh, earlier as well. Like, uh, who was here mouth to mouth? Very important channel. There's some new newsletters. There's online, uh, the website, uh, and, and all the different other event channels. And of course, the events itself. Uh, this is where it's happening as well. And in the relationship, it's a lot about the community and the sharing of the community with each other. Uh, that's how we want to stay connected with the whole network. <clears throat> And on the left side, we see the resources is the network. Yeah, so that's, that's 
course, the biggest strength uh, of SVODM, and together with a core team that's actually making it happen and making sure that all these events uh, take place. And the key activities, uh, the, what, what the team needs to do a lot is organizing these events, a lot of promotion, uh, making sure that people are aware of the events, are actually coming here. Um, and of course, there's some content uh, publication and curation that, uh, that takes place. And in the partnerships, a lot of partner associations, ASP was mentioned uh, earlier as uh, one of the partners, the universities, uh, so here you definitely see them coming back as well. Um, and what you also see in the partners um, is the, um, uh, what do we have? No, oh, I thought, oh yeah, we, we actually came up with, um, and we see regional and national uh, associations, right? Uh, where we see the regional associations are being mentioned here, but there are also more national um, associations there's some partnership with. And then the cost structure, it's the events that we, uh, that we actually see. Do you recognize this business model for SVODN? Yeah. Yep. Yeah? Make sense? Okay, good. Just as a, as a starting point, like, okay, because if we want to change something, then we first need to know where we are. Any more questions on the business model canvas, just in general, the whole template before I move on to the next part? Yes, there's a question over there. What's the structure? Is it a nonprofit? Is it... But the structure What's is the structure? SVOD? Is it a nonprofit and is it um, volunteer based? Is there a board of directors? And does that show up in here? So right now, uh, no, it's not. It's actually a part of my organization, my consulting business. So that's why we're creating the 501c3 to more formalize that. And with that comes the need for a board of directors and more uh, formal structures. But you can definitely see it in the cost structure as well, right? That otherwise, there would be employees, and that is not there. Could actually be a good point to put that in there, like no employee cost, eh? because that's, that's a differentiator, of course, that's there, because it's done on a voluntary basis as well. Yeah, good question. Any other thoughts or questions or just in, uh, about the SVODN network or the business model canvas in general? One of the values which I'm not sure we captured uh, yeah. is that we've had thought leaders as speakers, like yeah. Dr. Edgar Schein and uh, professors from Santa Clara University. And uh, I think a lot of the best turnouts came from um, being able to attract people like this who didn't charge us to speak, but sometimes brought up their book and sold it, et cetera. Yeah. So um, I think we need to capture that somewhere in our business plan. Or yeah, you're right. So, so maybe in the key partners as well, yeah. uh, or in the or in the key resources, it's that network that also has the thought leaders in the network that are willing to do this indeed for free, and we don't need to pay for that. Yeah, an in-kind exchange. Yeah. So you see that in the sponsorship as well. The sponsorship can be in kinds and can be um, uh, monetary, of course. So that's a, I think that's a good add-on. Yes. So. If we see um, the, the current business model, I want to take you as well through the process, right? Because now we've seen this tool, but how do you really use this tool in practice? So the first thing that we always do is we start with a phase that we call understand. Because, and we just did that very, very fast by just showing the current business model of SVODN. Normally we ask everyone, like, let's build that, but we only have an hour, a little over an hour today, so we didn't have the time to do all of that here. It also is connected to the vision. Like, how do we want to be seen in the outside world? What is the thing that we actually want to achieve as an organization or as an association? Doesn't matter. Yeah, but it really makes it different in like, oh, I just want to become rich and I want to sell my company for the, for the most money. Some people have that as their vision. That's fine, right? It's an individual vision. Or is it like, no, I really want to make an impact in the world and I want to make this world a better place. Those are two complete different visions. And it's all up on the individual to decide what's, what works for you or up to the organization. But it's important to know because you will do different things in your business model depending on that vision, right? So where do we really want to go to? You want to know the current business model. And also at the bottom is, is the context. What's actually happening in the world around us? Because we're not functioning in our own bubble. No, we're functioning in this whole world that we interact with. So what's happening in terms of trends? What's happening in terms of technology, uh, rules and regulation, competition, uh, the customer needs, of course, a very crucial one uh, that we need to identify. So what's happening there? 
You see the little sort of canvas tool? I mean, in this book, The Design a Better Business, you will find all those tools and canvases that we have at hand uh, in here as well. Hey, but it's important to know that. So once you have, you know, where you, where you are as an organization and where you want to go to in your vision, then you move into the next step, which is all about innovation, ideation. Now we know where we, want, where we are. <clears throat> now we can ideate and come up with different options. The most important part of this phase is that you ha come up with multiple options, right? The single right solution does not exist. Typically for an organization, we come up with 10 to 15 different business model options. And some of them are completely crazy. That initially you are like, really, how does that connect to my organization? How does that connect to my values? Or how does that connect to my vision? It doesn't, but that's not the point yet. Right? We're not there yet to make a choice. We're there to explore our options. I remember for, I was working with some not-for-profit organizations. So I tell them as one of the directions they should develop their business model for, I said, what if you would be a for-profit organization? What if you would be commercial? There were some people in the room that were like, I don't even want to think about that, right? I mean, I don't want to talk about money. I said, it's just a piece of paper, right? Let's spend some little time, just think about it. Don't lose your vision, right? You still want to do good for that purpose that you have in mind. But now you're going to approach it with a commercial mindset. What if? Right? Just give yourself uh, some, some space in your brain and, and develop that model. Don't spend days on it. Max an hour, you will be good, right? But write it down. And I remember there was one team, uh, one not-for-profit in there, they did it. And afterwards they said, like, whoa, you really opened my eyes because there are things in there. I can actually do them today. And they're, they're not dirty, right? I mean, it doesn't impact my vision. I can still achieve my vision, but I just should think different. And because of this exercise, I all of a sudden see it from a different perspective. And I see new opportunities that I didn't see before. So sometimes you really need to go, as we call, into space, really something completely crazy and out of your comfort zone. But this business model canvas allows you to do that because you can do it very fast eh, without writing a business plan. So that's, uh, that gives a lot of space. There's some other techniques mentioned. Uh, fresh watching. Fresh watching basically means looking fresh at other organizations. Take their business model and put it on top of yours. I mean, these days everyone takes Uber as a platform business model as an example. Okay, good. Take that business model, put it on top of yours. What does it look like? What do you get? Right? What kind of interesting insights are you getting? You know, the other one, patterns. We spoke about the bait and hook yeah, with, uh, with the coffee machine and the, and the uh, razor blades, printers. Can you come up with a pattern like that for your business model? Right? Is there anything yeah, that you can apply there? Just, just test it. It's just a piece of paper and a couple of post-its. Just try it out. What does that look like? Uh, epicenters means um, fixating basically one element of your current business model. If you would say, take the SV SVODN uh, business model, and the key resource we have is network. Let's completely empty the whole business model. We keep the network. What else might we do? Right? Uh, so you really develop from one angle of the business model canvas. Uh, insights is the customer insights. And we definitely always do a lot of customer research and what's the real problem that we're trying to solve for. That will also help you to come up with other directions. And the, and the what if, I uh, didn't even mention it on this sheet, uh, that was like, what if you would be a commercial organization all of a sudden, right? The what ifs are always the most fun to work on because you can go, go completely crazy. So what you see happening is you do a couple of business model options, then typically what we see is people immediately want to go to basically the end, now let's implement. Let's put our action plan together, we've done the exercise, we've, we had 10 business models, we like this one the best, let's go. But as you can see, there's a gap in between, right? So there's a very important thing that needs to happen in between, and that's what we call validation. And the validation is basically because that business model canvas that we took and all those post-its that we put there, they're all guesses, they're all assumptions. We think that that is correct, but hey, do we really know? Usually not, specifically not if we're going to go into more transformational innovation and more radical innovation. It's more and more guesses. So we need to test those guesses. We need to get out of the building and interact with our customers to figure out whether this is true or not. And then the testing is again about the angles, customer desirability, does my customer really want this, business viability, and do people want to pay for this, can I make a living out of this? 
And the other one, technical feasibility, can I actually build this? Hey, can I pull the team together? Or hey, if it's an R&D product, can I actually pull this together? So you need to prototype and get out of the building to really test with your customers before you make the final choice and get into implementation. <coughs> So that's the process that we go through. And it doesn't matter whether you're small or big. These are the four phases. Does that make sense? Any questions or thoughts on this? Oops. There's a lot of change management. Those are the words that can go in the pre-evaluation and implementation and post evaluation, where would that fit in over here? Sorry. Yeah, you were asking about the change management elements, right. right? Because there's a lot of change management. I think a lot of this is what we call search, right? We're really searching for this new business model. You see that typically here in scale, that's when we need to implement it and we really need to put it into practice. Here it's gonna be crucial, right? Like how do we design the organization to be ready to absorb this, this idea? Where do we put this? You see it happening here a little bit as well because it's part of the testing, specifically of the left side of the business model canvas and the resources, the activities, the partnerships that we have. And we can put those post-its on there, but is that actually gonna work in the organization? And these days, I, in every business model, I see big data popping up, right? And it's always there. And then you see in the key resources, data scientists, right? We need to get them. Are you capable of getting them? Do you know how to deal with them, right? Is your culture there to actually absorb that? And, and can you actually make that successful? Because those are crucial questions that you need to ask. And so I see the validation is both front stage and backstage. Typically, we call it a little bit more the technical feasibility, like can we actually do this, eh, which indeed is production, but also within the organization, are we capable of doing this? Yeah, so thank you for asking, because that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to, to realize. We do see that you go through a process like this pretty fast. It should take three, max six months, no longer than this. And of course, the whole implementation depends on how big or small your thing is, right? I mean, that's, that's something I cannot, uh, cannot say, but the whole ideation and validation, you sh really should do this very, very fast. The validation, we typically talk about sprints. Every week, definitely every two weeks, you need to do another validation loop, another validation round. And so don't start to stare at those post-its too long. Get out of the building, test that immediately, and change accordingly right away, right? So you, and also the internal testing is a crucial element of that. Yeah, yeah, so validation is both internal and external. Yeah, another question? Make sense? Uh -huh. Okay, good. So uh, what we see is those are the minimum strategic conversation as we like to call it, right? And there we say, of course, you can put all this thinking into a business plan. Please don't, right? Use these type of templates. We often create a room inside an office uh, wherever it takes place, or we, do an, uh, we create a virtual room, uh, whatever uh, works best for the organization, so that we can really keep all the post-its alive. The business model is not static. It's something that's super dynamic, specifically in this search phase that you're currently in. You basically change your business model every other week yeah, because all the insights, all the learnings that you get, you make those changes. And I mean, that, that was a very linear process how I uh, showed it to you, uh, step one, two, three, four. It always makes us feel very good. However, in reality, it really looks more like this, right? It's this roller coaster. And sometimes it's a lot of fun, and sometimes it's like, oh, this is no fun anymore, right? But that's, that's part of it. Uh, or another way of how we can show this, it's, it's what we call the double loop process. It all starts with a point of view, right? No matter who you are, where you are in your idea, you always have a point of view, always, right? So you start with that point of view. Then from point of view, you go into the next phase, which is all about understand. Yeah, what we just spoke about, current business model, vision, context, what's happening around us. Then you go into the next phase, which is all about innovation, ideation, and yeah, what can I do different? Because the understand and the ideate will again inform your point of view. Yeah, it will really fuel your point of view. Like, oh, now I have, I have a different point of view. I got more information. Then you go into the next one, which is about prototyping. 
how can I test uh, the ideation, everything that I've done there? How can I build something uh, that I can put in front of internal, external, whatever is needed, and move over to that next phase, which is about validation, and so really properly test so that my point of view gets informed again through my prototyping and through my testing. And there you see, this is a process that you will go through multiple times. Yeah, because every time it's like, oh, I understand better. Well, maybe I need to do something different in ideation. I need to build another prototype, and now I need to validate again. So you go through the loop a couple of times. It's not a linear process. I mean, it always looks so nice, a linear process, but in reality, it never is, right? It's always, it's always that process you go through. Yes? Thank you, Vijay. Um, so I have a, a question and a partial answer. So when you were talking about the two-week sprints, Yes. Uh, my, because this is a learning organization, my mind immediately went to the education system. And one of the major issues that you hear are teachers get the flavor of the year. Like, you know, OK, now we're going to try this. And that's even just with a one-year sprint. Mm -hmm. So if you think about if you have an education system and you're doing two-week sprints, I immediately envision losing the trust of your audience or the Spaden members because, you know, I just checked my email two weeks ago, and now we're suddenly doing something different and, and losing that baseline. That's very confusing. But yeah. then I got into a partial answer. Like in a, a schoolroom, I could imagine students coming in, and every two weeks there's some new learning adventure that they would be learning through that week. So I have both the problem about that trust space and continuity versus, well, there might be room for adventure in there. No, no, I think specifically with education, it's an interesting one. Never, never thought of it that way. But indeed, you, you come up with, okay, I want to do it in a different way, different method or different material, right, whatever it is. If you do it once and then two weeks later you're going to do it different, it probably most people will be very confused, right? And it's, it's not going to help achieving your vision and uh, getting to better students uh, or, or knowledge, more knowledgeable students. So, but the example that you say now, like, let's do it in the classroom, is for me not prototyping, that's actually implementing, right? So then we're basically just full-blown doing it instead of testing it. And what you see with prototyping, uh, prototyping for me even goes before a minimum viable product, right? Uh, those are the other terms, of course, we always use. But really, like, how can I get better feedback? So could you maybe, eh, well, still going through, OK, I keep my curriculum as it is. I just change something in the format. Eh, because will students really know this? Probably not even, right? Eh, as long as we, as we keep the, 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 um, the flow going and then the knowledge sort of in the right rhythm, eh, we're not changing that rhythm. OK, good. And if it's a different format, they might not even notice. Or what I do is I take 15 minutes at the end of class where I'm going to do a little test. And then you can even see it. Okay, all right, guys, we're going to do a little test here right now. And yeah, let's, let's go through this. And then I want to, I want to gather your feedback. Or a prototype could also mean um, I want to do something different in education. I actually create a nice flyer, uh, just a paper version of what I have in mind. And I'm going to put the flyer in front of you, or maybe three different ones with three different options. And I want to get your feedback as students. What do you think about this? So that's already another example of, for me, prototyping and validate, validation without immediately completely disrupting what you're currently doing, but testing it. And then if you have some solid foundation for, yes, people want to do this, then you can maybe say, let's do one class, right? And we're going to change it for this one class. Let's see how it resonates. And then we can slowly expand if all goes well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, um, so the first phase, so let's say, and you might have answered this by saying that this process is not linear, but when you are doing this kind of discovery phase, how do you know, I think I get caught up in the analysis paralysis stage where how do you know that you have a minimum threshold of knowledge and you, that you're interpreting it correctly so that you can move into the ideation phase? And maybe you do just learn by doing, but is there a way when you're starting out on a completely new problem to know when you can just say, OK, let's just start brainstorming? Yeah. I think the analysis paralysis is a very interesting one, right? That's a, that's a serious illness uh, that we see with a lot of organizations, a lot of people. Um, and you never know. And that's that uncertainty, right? That you, that you feel like, OK, when is it good enough? 
And also, I don't believe in a big bang launch, right? It's really about, okay, good, I've, uh, I'm still not for super comfortable, but I know I've done my 80-20 rule, right? I've, I've at least covered most of it right now. Let's just move on to the next phase. But indeed, as you said, the double loop, you don't stop learning, right? So you will get to new information. We keep on moving. As an example, I was, was working with a, a home care organization. We came up with a new business model. Crucial in that business model was a partnership with a hospital. So I told her, literally, we did a workshop, and then in the evening, I told her, like, okay, do you know a hospital, right? We should validate immediately with this hospital whether a partnership could work. And she's like, yeah, I know. I said, okay, give him a call and set up a meeting. No, no, but we just came up with this today, right? I first need to uh, do my research and my desk research and everything. I said, why, right? To have this conversation. It won't hurt you, right? It's just one conversation that you're having. So I, I stood next to her, like, pick up the phone, call him now. So she actually did. And she made an appointment for the next week. After that meeting, I called her, like, how did it go? And she said, oh, it was so amazing. It turned out he actually had some same thoughts in the same direction, right? And it was all still a little vague, right? We're just posted ideas. But since they were, he, he was invited from the beginning, they could actually further develop and, and, and get to that real value proposition together instead of you coming with, like, I've done all the research already. Are you in or not? And then people are like, oh, I'm disconnected here because you took some exits that are not interesting for me. If you would have done that different in the design, I might have joined you, right? So you can never get out too early. And that's, and that's really... We did a course the other day. It was, was just a public course. In the morning, we came up with an idea. At lunchtime, we created a prototype. And after lunch, we went out on the street to validate the prototype. And very interesting, there was one team that was so spot on. It was uh, about freshness of avocados and bananas, whatever they, they came up with. They were in the grocery store, and they ran into an Instacart manager. And the Instacart manager said, I need to have your phone number. We absolutely need to have something like this. I want you to speak to my boss about this. That happened on the same day, right? And it was even just a fake exercise because it was just a training to go through this. It was not even real, but you saw the buying signals. So imagine this is real. You go for it right away, right? And that was just after half a day of some, doing a few things. Yeah, so I really believe you cannot get out too early and, and get some customer feedback, even if it's just one or two, it's, uh, it's going to help you. Analysis paralysis, yeah, that's always, I love the word, actually. <laughs> so let me look, oh, how we're doing in timing. Um, because if we look into uh, this, this whole double loop process, uh, uh, it is about that ideation, and what you see is, um, we now know that there is no single rights uh, solution that we actually have. And we really need to explore all our options. And when we have all our options, we need to look into uh, what does that look like? Can we build those business models actually and put all those post-its together? Also very important in the ideation process is what we call kill your darlings. Uh, do you dare to throw out some of your ideas? And of course, think big. Uh, that's always, I'm always happy in this environment. The thinking big is more part of the local culture here. If I compare it to Europe, the think big is really different very often. Uh, but uh, here, luckily, most people dare to, uh, dare to dream big. Uh, and uh, it's, it's that famous Disney quote, if you can dream it, you can do it. And so that's where it all starts. Uh, or uh, another way of saying that is uh, use, your, use your yellow hat. Uh, be very positive. Don't think about why it sh would not work, because we can all think about reasons why something does not work. But stay positive, like why, well, what if, right? Uh, let's explore this together. So this whole notion of, uh, of brainstorming is, uh, is crucial. Um, Mirte is, uh, is, is guiding my slides there in the back. Uh, let's go to, to skip two slides. Y yes. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, no, previous one. Yes, that one. Some ideation guidelines uh, that, uh, that we see. Uh, if you start to brainstorm, there are a couple of rules. The no blah blah. And what we mean with that is sometimes one person puts out one idea, and before you know, we're talking a half an hour about that one idea. That was not the objective of brainstorming, right? Your brainstorming objective is get to as many ideas as fast as you can. We'll do the conversation later on. Yeah, so no blah blah. The yes ands have built it on top of each other and, and immediately saying like no, it will never work. Therefore, it's about quantity. Quality comes later. 
Yeah, let's first throw out a lot of our options. No black hats, yeah, this, so that's the no, it will never work, we'll never get the team together, we'll never get approval insights, none of that. The what if times seven, yeah, that's always what we like to say, ask yourself a lot of what if questions. What if we had all the money of the world, right? What if we had, uh, what if, what if Google would acquire us tomorrow? What would they do with it? What if we're at the commercial organization as the example earlier that we have? So really crazy what ifs, uh, challenge yourself. And also the why question is important. Yeah? Like why, and, and the why is mainly about the customer insights and the problem that you want to solve for a customer. Why is this really a problem? Can I dig one level deeper? Oh, maybe that's the real reason underneath this. Let's ask another why. Can we dig one layer deeper, right? So really ask yourselves to go a little bit further in the, in the thinking. And so uh, what we want to do now for the, for the sort of 15 minutes that we, uh, that we have left, we want you to apply this ideation and brainstorming about the SVODN. Uh, what could we do there? And we helped you already a little bit because I think if we're just going to throw it open, it's going to be like, oh, where do we actually start? And we knew we had short time today uh, because I can tell you normally we take a full day for uh, the whole ideation process. We're now doing that in 15, 20 minutes, <laughs> but just to, get, to give a little feel of that. And together with Jeff, uh, we identified a couple of what we call opportunity areas, uh, so to say, that we feel like, hey, there might be something in it. And we actually put an opportunity area on every table together with a business model canvas. And the opportunity areas that we, uh, that we see um, uh, how might we create value for students? I think students was a topic that was mentioned a couple of times. And so what kind of business models can we actually come up with for students? Does anyone have a blue sticky note with students on their, on their business model canvas? It's right here. Okay, so this is the, this is the table that's going to think about what might be a new business model around students. Then the other one uh, that we have is what about certification? Is there anything that we can do about that? Is that that table over there in the back? Certification, hey, there might be an interesting angle to it. Another one is partnerships. Who might we partner with and, and how would that actually create? Maybe if your team wants to swap out in front of Yeah, you can always, oh, that, that one was up there. Okay, it was the empty table, partnerships. So you can always throw that in as an additional joker. The other one that we have is uh, online only. And we always like to take it to extreme. And so let's just forget what we do today. What if we would do it completely online? And so that's that table over there. The other one is um, uh, learning by doing. Uh, where do we have that one? Do we have that one here? Yeah, so just like the design thinking, no design doing here. It's also learning by doing instead of talking about it. And then we have one that's related to not-for-profits. Yeah, so what could we do something in that space as well? Because that was an, was an interest area. And I think those are the ones, right, that we... Uh, one more? Oh, leverage. Yes, there we go. That was that one. 
how could we, because the, if you look at the OD network and all the, the knowledge uh, that is available in that network, like how could we really leverage that? How could we really make use of everything that is available with, uh, with all the OD experts that are connected to SVODN? How could we actually turn that into a value proposition if we think about that? So what I want you to think of for the next 10 minutes with your team, this was actually the original one, but I think that's going to be a little bit too much, but you can work up on that challenge if you, uh, if you want to. Look at the poster that you have. Indeed, if you're like, I don't know for this one, I want a different table, then you can move over to a different table. That's totally fine, right? And have a little brainstorm at your table, like throw out a couple of ideas and see if you can build at least one business model with that key item that's on your business model canvas. Yes, to complete the whole canvas. Oh, and normally we actually do three business models in six minutes, just to sort of set the standard here, because it's not about the blah blah and, and black hats, it's really about, oh yeah, let's see, right? Let's, what, what is some opportunity here? Oh, we got stuck here, let's look at another opportunity. That's totally fine. Give that a go for at least 10 minutes. Start with one. Okay. And I just want to think it's it's a great yes. Yes. And um again, learning by doing. Yeah. That's yeah. a very so interesting one, right? So spot in itself is a consultancy. So you might have a little break. So S B O D N is a consultancy so itself. Yes. As an yes. Yes. Okay. So our first part would be to look at um, customer segments. Is that where we start? Okay. If I could so say one more thing about like being a nonprofit. Okay. Yeah. So if you have big, we have businesses for for-profit organizations, and they can get tax deductions if they use the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and that's a real plus. Right. Because then they can use these services. They can use the people. And then they can take a tax deduction. Right. But you can't actually give money to a nonprofit and get a benefit from it. No, what I'm saying is that you can partner with businesses. They can use your services, the nonprofit. Not as a nonprofit. So a nonprofit, you can't get receive something of value from the nonprofit for your contribution. You have to deduct that from what you take as a tax deduction. So for instance, if I had you come in and do a service for me. And you are. A, a business. Exxon. Yeah. And I give you $150 for that. When you come in, I, I, I can't take that as a deduction. No, they don't give you money. You don't talk about money. Oh, okay. You talk about that it's, it's a contribution. Of service. Yes. But you service. can't contribute services. But you don't you don't have to you don't have so to have any money involved. Yeah. Start writing immediately. Okay, great. That's why so where do we start? It? Is this is this am I doing this? Yes, you guys yeah. were doing that. We were totally weren't fine. We? I didn't give you proper instructions. <laughs> okay, where do we start? I realize that. So you're the not for profit the non profit consultancy. Right. Yes. Uh, what are the things that you've been discussing so far? Yeah. What nonprofits can and can't do. Yeah. So let's talk Why about what the opportunity is, which is where yep. you were starting. Yep. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, the opportunity is there's a tax advantage. There's also an advantage of uh, going to other companies for yeah. services mm -hmm. and them coming to us for services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, what would I write down on a post-it note uh, related to that? I'm always like, how can I put that on? Because tax advantage. I'm like, okay, good. Don't know where it will fit. We'll figure that out. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. I mean, it's right. You're also uh -huh. doing good. So you're actually fulfilling yes, something for good. a vision, yes. uh -huh. which is a yeah, big so that's sell. all very yeah. much part of the value problem, actually, I yeah. think, right? what you're going to offer, so. right? So, because yeah. this is maybe the sort of service that yeah. you have. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and this is the promise uh, that yeah. you will get if you if you get our consultancy. These are some of the promises mm -hmm. that are yeah. related to that. Right. Yeah, so you basically already started. Sometimes okay. it's just a matter of what you say is usually pretty good. Just yeah. put it on the post it and you can always take it off if you come okay. up with something. Let's better. try that. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So key resources would be oh, oh it's community. the people. It would be the people. Yeah, and also Silicon Valley. Being the Silicon Valley identity is a huge branding. Yeah. What did you say? Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. 
Um, Customer segments and expansion. So whatever you call the foot soldiers or the on the ground, the each and every, the the worker, right? That could be a, a segment because a worker who's so well informed about structure. Teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would put individuals. <laughs> This one. Oh, that one. It's uh, still on. I hear you in the... So some final thoughts uh, before, uh, before we leave, uh, because what we've been speaking about today is uh, in order to create value, we need these new tools, uh, skills, and mindsets. So a couple of things that are important there. Number one is that uh, we need to think like a designer and not just thinking like a designer, but it's the actual design doing uh, that, we're, uh, that we're talking about. And what you see is in the past, we could just choose one solution, uh, but today it's all about like, how can we generate our options, right? How can we really explore our multiple options and explore multiple business model uh, canvases that we have there? Number two is about uh, get out of the building. And we had a couple of examples there. You cannot start soon enough with getting out of the building. Don't rely on your assumptions, but really get to this lab, set up these experiments, and really learn immediately uh, from that. And why are you doing that? That's because you want to fill fast. You want to learn faster. And that's the whole thing. It's all about speed. Number three, we didn't really practice that, but drawing is the new writing. I think can work very visual and even working with post-its is already very visual but you saw it with an espresso example and these visuals are really really helpful you can even create a business model like this and this is just the same nine building blocks for Spotify but instead of post-its we actually visualized it this is sort of the next level visualization I have to say I'm not capable of doing this I can do the Nespresso icons that's as far as I can get we have some people in the team that actually do this as well. So you can really use it as a storytelling and to activate uh, your story in the organization. The other one is uh, prototyping, uh, number four. And so how can I build quick prototypes? And not immediately as we have the conversation about something that's already ready to launch, but how to get better feedback, basically. Yeah? What, can we, what can we build there? Uh, and it's really about, uh, and I love that quote uh, that we have up here, you don't learn to walk by following rules, you learn by doing and by falling over. And that's, that's the whole notion of this whole prototyping. Combined with number five is about visit the future. Uh, this, you can also use this tool for scenario planning. Now, I'm currently working with an organization that's looking at unmanned traffic management. Uh, the minute we get to flying cars and drones that do autonomous delivery and all that, that traffic management is going to yeah, going to be pretty complicated uh, but you can already look into the scenarios it's not there yet but you can definitely look into the future and uh, what might that actually uh, look like uh, the other one is uh, embrace uncertainty uh, we, we started with that uh, earlier today uh, yes there is a lot of uncertainty but we should be able to embrace it and really understand the notion and the difference what we call between search and execute yeah, whereas a standing organization, we're always in execute mode, but we should also dedicate some time in that search and really embrace that uncertainty and go about that. So what's next for you? My tip is always start small, right? Don't immediately start to roll this out very big. Start small, as, start with a small initiative, just, just give it some tries and basically prototype and validate yourself. Is this something for me? Is this something for my organization? Am I getting somewhere? Um, the other one is stop meeting about it, yeah, because uh, <laughs> too often I see a lot of meetings and still nothing is happening, it's the blah blah blah, right? And the other one of course as well is don't, um, and don't write um, uh, the, the business plans, I think we need to go the other direction, uh, Myrthe. Uh, yep, that one. Um, and let's, let's not spend a lot of time uh, writing business plans, it's all about speed. And I hope with the business model canvas, of course, I gave you at least a tool to like, okay, I can structure my thoughts without needing to go there. I have some, uh, some elements uh, in here. Uh, and uh, it's, it's all about like, uh, learn from your customers, have that conversation with your customer and be a rebel uh, while, uh, while you're out there. Or basically another way to frame it is just do it, right? So throw away that business plan. 
uh, use the business model canvas, right, if you want. I think it's a, it's a very good tool to, uh, to actually use or use any of the other tools. And so there's that, uh, that yellow book, Design a Better Business. Uh, we actually have a box here um, and we, uh, we have to purchase it as well from, from our producer, but we can, uh, we can sell it to you as well. It's, uh, it's $22.5, I think on Amazon it's just a little bit more expensive, but you can also order it online if, you, uh, if you're interested in this, but we also have it here. Um, and so, so get yourself familiar with sort of the latest uh, tools and skills. And with all this, I, I hope that you will all leave the room sort of like superheroes, right? With the business model canvas underneath your arm to, to change your organization or change the organizations uh, that, uh, that you're working for. I think that's it. Thank you for everything.